number two. If you remember, just kind of a quick review, Amos, of course, was contemporary with Isaiah. Amos was a, a prophet to the northern tribes called Israel. And Isaiah preached unto Judah or the southern tribe. As we think of this time period, remember that Amos is preaching about 40 to 30 years prior to Israel being taken into captivity to Assyria. Now, we looked at already in the first chapter where God says several times for three transgressions and for four. And of course, we, we mentioned that that is not saying that there was four additional ones. But the three transgressions kind of brought them up to the line of judgment. And the fourth stepped over that line. Signifying that judgment is true. It's going to be coming. And it's set. We talked about how there is a, a, a time where God says enough is enough. And even though you might start seeking Him, He's bringing punishment. And they had crossed that line. Uh, I'd mentioned even talking about in the New Testament where it talks, uh, Jesus talking about in John, I believe it's chapter number 8, where he said that um, you shall seek me and not find me. Why? Because they had sinned away their opportunity. And that's kind of what he's referring to here. And, and first he talked about Damascus and Gaza and then Tyre. And then he started talking about, uh, last week we looked at Edom, those genetic family kind of people, and Ammon and Moab. And no doubt, listen, he's talking to Israel. And these people are people who was uh, against Israel time and time again. And no doubt Israel was like, all right. All right, finally, God's going to get them. God's going to get them. All right. And they was liking that. And they was probably getting all excited within themselves, talking to each other. <laughs> See, I told you one day God would take care of this. And they was thinking all about this. But the sermon wasn't done. The message wasn't complete. And he continues, and we're going to pick it up in Amos chapter 2 and verse number 4. And he says, Thus saith the Lord for three transgressions of Judah and for four, I will not turn away the punishment thereof, because they have despised the law of the Lord and have not kept His commandments. And their lies caused them to err after which their fathers have walked. But I will send a fire upon Judah, and it shall devour the palaces of Jerusalem. Man, can you imagine the ch children of Israel now? There's be always been this kind of a big brother, little brother rivalry going on and there was always this contention between it and there was uh, different times wars between them. And so, no doubt, they was like, oh, yeah. He's getting all of them, but now he's going to get them. You see, because there's kind of a jealousy thing there. Remember, Judah had Jerusalem, the seat of the country. Judah had Solomon's palace, the temple, David's home that he had built. There was this elation in their hearts as they thought about this. No doubt, I, I don't know, if I, if I would have been Amos, I'd have probably let him glory in a, a little bit. 
because they th they're thinking, ah, oh, yeah, everybody's getting judged. Everybody's getting judged. Way to go, God. Way to go. But the problem is, they didn't realize what was coming. You see, the Bible clearly tells us that these people, uh, Israel, had cheap imitations of everything. Remember, Jeroboam the first had made this idol of gold and was calling it their god in place uh, of what they was doing at the temple. And the Bible here tells us, okay, the reason Judah is getting destroyed is because they despised the law of the Lord. There was corruption and stuff going on. And they did not keep His commandments. They did not listen to what the Bible had said. You see, they missed that part. The Bible says their lies caused them to err. The lies of who? The lies of the prophets, the lies of the preachers, the lies of the supposed holy men, the high priests and stuff. You see, their sin was worse than all the others. Why? What caused this? Solomon did. He brought in the idols. He brought in all the wives from all the different countries. He set up idol worship. And the children learned from it. Granted, there was kings during Judah's day that tried to clean it up, but it didn't take them long to get back to where they were and even worse. But just like in those days, I want you to think about this. Just like in those days. Remember, the children of Israel are called God's peculiar people, right? In the Old Testament. They're called the children of God. God's chosen one. He is elect at that time. But the people that were called by His name... Listen, I did not say they were going to heaven. They were called by that name, rejected everything He said and stood for. And God said, enough is enough. For three transgressions and for four... I'm bringing judgment, and I'm not turning it away. I want you to equate that to today. You look at Canada. Now, I'm not talking about true gospel, but Canada claims to be a Christian nation, right? Some, hey, a lot of Catholics claim to be Christian, but they, then they turn around and say, I'm Catholic. Neither here nor there. But you look at this city, how many church buildings we have in this city? How many church buildings are strung out through the countrysides? They call themselves... God's children, but they do not follow God. How long until God says, okay, Canada, enough is enough. For three transgressions and for four, I am bringing judgment. By the way, he's saying the same thing down south too. It's coming. I have no doubt about that. But now, thinking back to our message, Israel's all excited. They're feeling pretty good about themselves. 
Praise God. God's taken care of Dam Damascus and Gaza and Tyre and Edom and Ammon and Moab. And praise the Lord. He's going to take care of Judah too. And then Amos draws a little smirk on his face. They're, they're amen and hallelujah, raising their hands, having a great old time. And then Amos starts, Thus saith the Lord, for three transgressions of Israel. Then all of a sudden, you could hear a pin drop. And for four, I will not turn away the punishment thereof. Whoa. Now he's directing at us. You know, that's the way people the way people are in the world. When we see God judging other people, we're like, yeah, 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 yeah. But as soon as he proclaims it on us, it's No. God would why would God do that to us? You know? That's how we would be. You know, can you imagine? Uh, I'm thinking of the movie that we have of Jeremiah. And uh, Jeremiah, of course, was a prophet in the last days of Judah. And he was um, prophesying against Jehoiakim, who was named something else by uh, Nebuchadnezzar he was given a new name Zedekiah and in, in the, the movie they're depicting um, Zedekiah talking to his head king or his head general and, and everything that Jeremiah was prophesying was coming true I mean the Babylonians came and, and then left and they said, oh, they won't be back. They just want to set up a garrison. And they come back again. And, and remember when Jeremiah comes in with the yoke on his shoulders, telling uh, the people that they're going to be put in bondage and a, a lion prophet come up and broke the yoke off and said, no, this, this is how God's going to break the yoke of bondage of Babylon off of Judah. And... They was looking at all this, okay, but yet his prophecies kept coming true. And he's walking with the, the general, and he looks at the general. Well, what are, you, what are you saying? Or he says something to the effect of, but what if what he's saying is true, and God's going to destroy this city? And he turns around and looks at him and says, now why would God destroy his city, his temple, and why would God accuse you of not following Him? And the king just stopped. He didn't want to answer that. Why? Because that would be admitting that he wasn't following God the way he knew he should. And so that's what we have here. He, he's coming to Israel, and, and Israel was all excited about everything that was going to happen to everyone else. And now, listen, all of a sudden, it's pointed at them. God says for three transgressions and for four just to us, like He did everybody else. He's coming to this part of His message. Now, instead of Amos probably being a guy that was bringing good news, he was despised and was not looked upon. Why? Because once again, the people, they were calling themselves children of God, the children of Abraham. We follow Jehovah. But you see, there's more than just saying you do something. It's all that other stuff you have on the side that you're trying to put with it that's not supposed to be there. The Bible says in the uh, Ten Commandments, Thou shalt make unto thyself no graven image. And here they had idols around. In Bethel, 
You know, they stuck idols in, in some of the great historical places where Abraham had built altars. They placed idols there. Talk about sacrilege to that area. And then he goes from um, talking about the doom of the rebellious Israel because, listen, they had no king that ever followed. No one. Not even got close from the time Jeroboam and the northern ten tribes left until this point. And not even after this point until they go into captivity. So now he comes and he begins to do something that he didn't do before. Now before, if you notice, when we would read these... Um, there goes a the pen. Okay, Moab, three verses. Ammon, three verses. Edom, two verses. Tyre, two verses. Gaza, three verses. And Damascus, three verses. He just used a few verses talking about those, right? Now look at this. We're still in, in verse 6, the second part. He says, Because they sold the righteous for silver and the poor for a pair of shoes. They had no integrity whatsoever about them. There was injustice all around in Israel. Verse 7, that pant after the dust of the earth on the head of the poor and turn aside the way of the meek and a man and his father will go in unto the same maid to profane my holy name. Man, not only was there injustice, there was immorality. The Bible specifically says those things should not happen. But yet it was profaned. They profaned his name by doing it. Now some commentaries want to go and say, oh, they was just going to the same prostitutes. No, that's not what, to me, that's not what the Bible says. It just says they went to the same woman. And the low, low morality that had to have. And they lay themselves down upon clothes laid to pledge by every altar. And they drink wine of the condemned in the house of their God. Talking about their idolatry. They made them beds in around the altar. Drinking wine. Hooping it up and partying around it. Idolatry was all over. Yet I destroyed the Amorite before them, whose height was like the height of the cedars. In other words, they had a, a lot of people. And he was strong as oaks. Yet I destroyed his fruit from above and his root from beneath. He said, I wiped them out. I protected you. You did me like this. I protected you. I favored you. And you still continue to do those things. Remember when they was trapped in the city? And they seen the multitude around the mountains surrounding them and the next day they were all dead? I also brought you up from the land of Egypt and led you 40 years through the wilderness to possess the land of the Amorite. 
He said, I brought you out and I gave you somebody else's land. They had tilled it. Remember, a land that flows with milk and honey. They talked about the, the spies going in and bringing out the clusters of grapes on poles. My word, I'd like to have that cluster. I can't even fathom how many grapes that is or how big they might have been. That's unreal. And I raised up of your sons for prophets and your young men for Nazarites. Listen, I raised up people who would follow me and teach you and, and lead you in the right direction. Is it not even thus, O ye children of Israel, saith the Lord? But ye gave the Nazarites wine to drink. I was raising up people who would serve me, and you corrupted them. How many times do we hear about preachers getting called to preach and going into churches and the church corrupting them by threatening to fire them if they preach the Bible? Kind of sound familiar? Oh, preacher, just back off a little bit. You don't, you don't need to be that hard or stern. Man, this is the 21st century. Come on. God said, Pfft. days a thousand years and a thousand years a day to me. Century doesn't matter to me. All that matters is that you follow me. Amen. And commandment and commanded the prophets, saying, This is the part I was talking about. Prophesy not. Today, the day we live, the the deacon board, the the women's deacon boards telling the preacher, don't you preach out around here. You'll be down the road quicker than you can blink your eye. We don't want any of that around here. That's what's happening in the world today. Listen, if God doesn't judge our nation, He owes Sodom and Gomorrah a big I'm sorry. God never tells I'm sorry to anyone. See, they had the sin of injustice, immorality, idolatry, ingratitude, intolerance for the things of God. These are their crowning sins. These are the reason God said, okay, enough is enough. You're getting destroyed. There was no justice for all. There's just justice for the rich. God had fought for them and protected them, but they were still rejected the Lord, and now He was going to reject them. God has did so much for Christians down through the centuries and little by little the people that call themselves by his name are rejecting his ways and his things and I, th I, I can't help but think there's going to be more or a higher percentage of people in this day and age over any other age that's going to stand before God and he's going to look down and say depart from me ye worker of iniquity I never knew you because we've corrupted the things of God we've changed it all and then he goes from that he presented them the facts of his case you know of course he's talking to the people he's about to judge, right? He didn't talk to Tyre. He wasn't talking to Damascus and all them here. He was talking to Israel. He just gave a little excerpt on why he was judging them. But here he takes six verses and presents the facts of the case. Where before he... And that doesn't even include uh, the first couple of verses 
where he proclaims what he's going to do. And then he goes from telling the facts of the case to telling them their future. Their future in verses 13 through 16. And he said, I, Behold, I am pressed under you. Now what does that mean? I mean, we stop and we think about that. Now how is God pressed under them? What it's talking about is the magnitude of their sin has burdened him. He said, I am pressed under you as a cart is pressed that is full of sheaves. You take a, a big old tractor trailer load. and Have you ever taken and loaded a car down and you're traveling or something and you loaded it down and you step back and all of a sudden the top part of the rear wheels are gone? And you're like... I didn't know the thing had squat that far. The other day we was cutting those trees down and uh, gave most of the wood to the neighbor and he was using uh, another neighbor of ours' truck. Well, he was loading these pieces of log on it and he went and, I guess he went and weighed one of the chunks. He said one of the chunks weighed 100 pounds by itself. And he put quite a few on that little S10. Uh, and I, I mean I looked over and the S10 this is the front of the S10 this is the back it was sitting like this and I thought land sakes I said Junior's going to have a cow he sees that he said ah Junior said to reverse buckle them springs just load her down I was like yeah until you hit a bump and they break but anyway that picture come to my mind when I read this verse and studied it. That truck was under such a burden of the load of wood that it squatted it. And that's the picture God is bringing across here in verse 13 as a cart is pressed that is full of sheaves. I mean, I forget what we was doing Oh, it was my uncle's trailer we was loading full of scrap metal and he'd put a little too much on it and the tires were rubbing the fenders. It had squatted it down so far. And that's the kind of picture that comes to my mind when and God was just so burdened by not just their sin, but the magnitude of their sins. And that's what God's trying to help them to see. Your sins go way beyond what should have ever most people would allow. I've been more than gracious to you, but enough is enough. And He tells them, He says, Therefore, because your sins are so great, the flight shall perish from the swift. In other words, those that have the ability to run fast can't escape. You're not going to get away from this one. And the strong shall not strengthen his force. Your strong is not going to be able to help in the battle. They're just going to be like weaklings in this battle. Because remember, when God comes in, He doesn't need muscle and might. He could wipe it out just like that. No resistance. And that's what He's talking about. You're not going to be able to get away. There's not going to be any resistance. Neither shall the mighty deliver himself. No one's going to escape it. No one's going to survive this. Is kind of the, the theme that he's bringing here. Neither shall he stand that handle the bow. In other words, you're not going to be able to stand back from this one and shoot your bow. I'm going to wipe you all. And he that is swift of foot shall not deliver himself. Neither shall he that rideth a horse deliver himself. Listen, 
you're not even going to be able to hitch a ride and get away from this thing. God says, hey, I'm coming for you, and it's going to be ugly. And he that is courageous among the mighty shall flee away naked that day, saith the Lord. Now, I, I don't literally believe he's talking about, and maybe he is. They're going to be so scared they won't even bother to get dressed. They'll just jump out of their beds and run. But remember, they're naked in the, in the Bible. is a whole lot different than ours. The prophet turns his thoughts to the future. And now, consider this. The rest of the book is him talking about Israel. So, can you imagine how their joy and elation... I mean, they're up there and they're like, oh yeah, God's, God's going to get them, get them, get them. And then all of a sudden, God just starts pounding on them through the Word and saying, this is coming to you. This is what I'm going to do. This is why I'm going to do it. And so, th these first two chapters is kind of the setup for the rest of the book and how it's going to go. And no doubt, they're, they're sitting there thinking to themselves, oh, but you know, it didn't even change him then. You know, Satan has people so blinded, had people so blinded in that day. Now, I don't know for sure that that little conversation between Zedekiah and uh, Shapham, or however you pronounce his name, the general, I don't know if that's really how that went. But no doubt that thought had to come to someone's mind. Why would God destroy His temple? Because remember, Jeremiah said, there's not going to be one stone set upon another of that temple. Well, this is the house of God. Jehovah. They're just a couple of decades removed from Josiah. Probably the greatest king since David. Why would God destroy his house? That's where he lives. That's where he dwells among us. Truth of the matter is, God hadn't dwelt there in years. Truth of the matter. God hasn't been in a lot of these facilities around here if even ever for a long time we need to pay attention to what God tells us in the New Testament so something doesn't happen to us Amen. Draw nigh unto God, and He'll draw nigh unto you. Amen. Let's pray.